Hello. I'm Nancy McGaw. I'm Deputy Director of the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program, and I am delighted to welcome all of our viewers today to this book talk. We're so uh, delighted that you've come to hear from Rebecca Henderson about her important, urgent, and I think ultimately hopeful new book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. There's my copy, well-marked and well-read. And reading the book, I actually had a sense that Rebecca must have felt compelled to write this book, uh, that she had this opportunity to share her deep expertise and, and understanding of what business needs to do now and what is possible. Uh, the book has been referred to as a wake-up call. It's also been called an indispensable guide for saving capitalism from itself. And that's a, a provocative um, introduction to a book, but I think it's an important one. The book is filled with research, but it's also filled with stories, compelling stories that really demonstrate to the reader how change, although difficult, can and must be achieved. Uh, Rebecca Henderson is the John and Natty MacArthur University Professor at Harvard University. She's a prominent economist and a leading authority on organizational and strategic change. She advises leading companies and serves as a director on two Fortune 500 companies, uh, Amgen and IDEX Laboratories. For those of you who are admirers of Unilever, you will um, be interested to know that Rebecca had been invited to facilitate a number of Paul Pullman's retreat, strategic retreats with senior executives. Rebecca teaches at the Harvard Business School, and a few years ago, she created a course entitled, Guess What? Reimagining Capitalism. When it was first offered, I think, Rebecca, you had 28 students, right? And now nearly 300 students take this course each year, which is almost a third of the Harvard MBA course. Um, I have to say in 2017, we recognized uh, Rebecca and her colleagues with our idea Ideas Worth Teaching Award uh, for this breakthrough course. So when Rebecca agreed to do this book talk, we were thrilled and we said, you know, we were wondering who would be the perfect interlocutor uh, for this conversation. And we decided to go out to another um, faculty member, also an award winner from the Aspen Institute, Mauro Guillon, who in 2013 received our Faculty Pioneer Award. And we were delighted when he accepted the invitation to be in the conversation. So Mauro is at um, Wharton. He's a professor of international management. Uh, he also just created a course in the COVID time on pandemics and financial disasters. I'm sure you can learn more about that online. We're delighted to have him here. And here's the good news for our viewers. Morrow has his own book coming out. You can see it behind him there, 2030. Let me get the, the uh, proper title. Uh, it is, well, I've got it here. Never mind. It's about trends that are coming. I had it written on my notes, but I've lost it. Trends coming. You can see it behind him that are going to collide and, and reshape everything. And on September 10th at noon, Rebecca and Morrow are going to change places, and Rebecca is going to interview Morrow about his book. So I'm going to turn it over to our guest today because we only have 45 minutes. We want to get right into the conversation. Please notice that at the bottom of your screen, many of you know where this is located, there's a question and answer um, space. So please add your questions as they occur to you. And, and uh, Mara will integrate them into the conversation. I'm going to pop off now and rejoin you at the conclusion of the book talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy, for your kind introduction. I'd like to uh, let Rebecca also um, welcome our participants. Uh, Mauro, thank you so much. I'm honored and delighted to be here. And Nancy, thank you so much, both for the invitation to talk today, but for all the work that the Aspen Institute does in this space. Uh, you are a beacon to all business people who are 
are looking to find practical, actionable ways to really make a difference in the world and to transform capitalism as they do. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. So let's talk about your book, Rebecca. Um, I read it uh, pretty much in one evening, so I would encourage everyone who's listening uh, to uh, get a copy, get hold of a copy as quickly as you can. Uh, but we're going to, you know, tell you about, uh, you know, the book today through a number of questions. I'm very much hoping to get a lot of questions from the audience. And as Nancy said, I will integrate them into the conversation here. So please start asking your questions as we go. Um, Rebecca, you, when I first met you in 1992, we we're talking about this uh, earlier, uh, you were um, an economist specializing in technology management and also strategic uh, management. What made you switch into doing serious research on the topic of the environment, climate change, the role of the business firm in society, capitalism, all of these really, really important issues. If you could tell us when did that happen and how did it happen? Oh, Mara, what a polite way of saying like, what happened? <laughs> um, I was for many years the Eastman Kodak professor at MIT. That was actually a coincidence, but it was a deeply ironic one because that's what I did. I started, I studied innovation in very large firms and why it was so hard for successful firms to do anything differently. And about 15 years ago, energy firms started showing up in my office saying, we know the world is going to change and can you help? So I started to get very interested in climate change as a business problem. And then I saw Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And I did something I've, I've never done either before or, or since. I sent an email to every single contact on my contact list saying, you have to see this movie. I mean, it, it seemed to me then, and having now spent 15 years studying it, it feels to me now as if climate change is one of the great existential risks uh, threatening our civilization and the future of business. And I thought, well, whoa, this is just a change problem. And I do change. So, hey, I started working with firms that were trying to respond to the challenge of climate change and build new business models. And then I moved to Harvard and the students told me like, wait, Rebecca, it's not just climate change. You have to focus on inequality as well because a, inequality is incredibly important. It, it poses the same kind of threat to the long-term health of our society. And it's deeply interrelated with climate change. I mean, we know that uh, people of color are hugely more likely to live next to the power station and suffer from worse health as a result and die from COVID as a result. So I ended up deeply interested in this, these issues of climate change and inequality. And the big question, what could business do? Yeah. So at the time when you made this uh, fateful switch, I should say, that has essentially sent your career onto an even more distinguished, uh, you know, trajectory, I would say, um, the concept of shareholder value, if you remember, was essentially the dominant philosophy, right, amongst uh, market participants, uh, corporate leaders, even at business schools like yours uh, and mine, right? So in the book, you advanced another idea uh, and you compare it to shareholder value. And that's the idea of shared value. So could you explain to us um, the differences between the two? So thank you for the kind words. I'll be sending over the crate of good wine after the talk. <laughs> um, Shared value, shareholder value. Shareholder value is returned to investors. And we told firms that all they needed to focus on was maximizing return to investors. In retrospect, that was a mistake. I've been on, uh, I have 25 years cumulative experience on major public boards, and I understand the need to return a decent return to your shareholders. I really understand. But telling managers it was the only thing they needed to focus on was a deep mistake. And shared value illustrates why. What is shared value? Shared value says, yes, you can make money for your investors, but you can also 
solve some of the big social and environmental problems that we face. And you should look for those joint opportunities. And of course, you're going to say, well, you know, are those win-win opportunities really out there? If people were looking to make money, wouldn't they find them naturally? But here's how I think about it. I think we're on the edge of a major transformation of the economy. We have to build an economy that is environmentally sustainable and works for everyone, or very bad things are going to happen. And that is both a social shift, but it's also a technological shift. And these major shifts, the switch from fossil fuels to renewable power, the move away from meat-based agriculture, the remaking of supply chains so that they are genuinely circular, so that we reuse everything, treating people, um, I call it high road in the book, high road business models. So you treat people with dignity and respect. All of these things are going to be more and more important. And the firms that move first will make a great deal of money if they get it right. It's not a coincidence that the most valuable automotive company in the world right now is focused on electric vehicles. And so this is a change moment. And that's what it means to create shared value is to look around at how the world is changing and work out how you can make money from it. And that takes creativity and courage and strategic vision. So it's not like it's easy. And if you're just focused on, no, 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 go away. I'm just maximizing shareholder value. Everything's going to be fine. Don't bug me, which as the Kodak professor, I can tell you a lot of business people spend a lot of time in that mindset. You'll miss these kinds of opportunities. So shared value creates um, shareholder value, but it requires energy and focus to find and work for. But it's where we need to go. It's absolutely the path forward. Yeah, so um, in the book, you take this uh, argument, I think, one step further. So it's not just businesses that need to change, but maybe there's also something wrong with the market, right? Uh, so let me ask you this question, right? What is the bigger problem you know, on your mind? Is it that the market is not doing its job or that we cannot rely on the market alone? Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I think they're the same problem. Free markets are one of the great inventions of the human race. You know, I teach at the Harvard Business School. I think free market capitalism is an unparalleled source of prosperity and growth and innovation. I'm a believer. But when the market is no longer free and fair, it becomes very dangerous. We know that healthy societies rest on three foundations, not just the free market, but also democratically accountable, transparent, responsive, capable government and strong civil society. And if you try and put all the weight on the free market, if you give the firms all the power, no rules, no constraints, what do you get? You get a world in which it's okay to pump fossil fuel pollution out the window, even though it imposes enormous harm right now on the society. The health costs of fossil fuels run in the trillions of dollars and the millions of lives. And yet it's not in the price. Right. That's not free markets. In a free market, prices reflect genuine supply and demand. If I can use something and impose enormous costs on others, that's not what we were talking about when we meant a free market. A free market is genuine competition. If I can set the rules of the game, if I can flood the political system with money and get bills passed that make sure like, hey, yeah, sure. You know, we should only have two cell phone providers and they should have this elevated rate. Or if you're an internet provider and oh, don't regulate me as a media company, you know, let me do anything I want. If I can set my own rules, that's not free market capitalism. And I think this is more controversial. If you're in a society in which government is for whatever reason, no, look, not, no longer looking out for people at the low end of the distribution, if essential workers 
cannot make a living wage. If people have to work two jobs, they don't have health benefits, they don't have childcare benefits. If the educational system and the healthcare system are such that if you're born in the wrong zip code, the odds of your, in, your children doing better than you are are less than 50%. If that's all true, I think you have a duty to support freedom of opportunity and genuine, uh, genuine redistribution. Um, as you know, in the book, I suggest that means we need to rebuild the institutions of capitalism, that business should be pushing for the government that can make sure that the rules of the game are such that when I maximize shareholder value, I also maximize prosperity and individual freedom. Yes, yeah, so just uh, brought into the discussion, Rebecca, uh, an actor that um, we haven't discussed yet, which is the government. And we have two questions from the audience uh, that are actually along those lines. So let me... Um, uh, let me use them at this point because I think they will help uh, clarify some of the really interesting arguments that you have in the book about the role of the government. So the first question is about corporate lobbying. Um, so uh, this attendee says, look, corporate lobbying in the U.S. has broken the government and impeded our democracy from doing what is necessary to fully address climate change. So he's asking, what can we as citizens do to prevent corporations from essentially preventing the government uh, from doing what it needs to do in order to address climate change. So in the book, I argue that one of the most important things that firms can do right now is lobby to get money out of politics, is lobby to support the strength of our democracy. So every firm I talk to, I say, I think you should give people time off to vote. I think you should, when your state puts in place gerrymandering rules, whether they're Democrat or Republican, you should object. Just as many CEOs stand up right now and say LGBTQX discrimination is not okay, so suppressing voters should not be okay. Business has a real interest in the health of the democracy. Now, what can you do? If you work for one of these companies, you can join with your colleagues and you can make a fuss. You, as a citizen, you should be voting for politicians who put political reform first and foremost. They're not just Democrats. There are some very uh, newly elected members of the House of Congress who are Republicans who are all over democracy re reform and are in favor of the 28th Amendment, which will get money out of politics. So I think we as individuals have a central role to play in rebalancing our system so that business can do what they do well, which is create jobs and compete and innovate. And business can do what it needs to do, which is make sure there's a level playing field, make sure that dangerous pollution like climate change pollution is properly regulated and that everybody has a chance to play. That's right. And we're getting um, a, a lot of questions on the following issue, which is, Okay, so let's say that we agree with you on what you're saying. How can we change the minds of business leaders? And I guess there's a section, um, a chapter in the book that I think speaks to this, which is you try to lay out the business case for reimagining capitalism. So could, could you walk us through those arguments? Because I think they will answer several of these questions that we're getting in the Q&A. Sure. So the whole book is in essence an answer to this question. I've worked with business people all my life. And I promise when I walk into a new meeting cold, I don't start with, you have a duty to remake the democracy. No, 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 no. I try and start where people are and that's where the book starts. So I start with the potential to make money and do the right thing. Shared value is a real thing. In the book, I lay out five major business models and I describe several concrete stories of billion dollar opportunities and $100,000 opportunities to, to make a difference. But then the book is essentially a story of how business evolves from that first step to dealing with these much larger questions. So in my experience, firms that start to create shared value, pretty much two things happen. One is everybody discovers that, oh my God, it works. That when you have a purpose that's broader than simply making money, that, and it's authentic, that levels of productivity and creativity and engagement go up very significantly. In the book, I talk about the fact that in the best performing industries, productivity is twice as high for the high performing firms than the low performing firms, that I spent 20 years in windowless conference rooms trying to make that result go away and it would not. 
how you manage has huge effects. So these firms tend to become more purpose-driven, more and more engaged. They work on creating shared value, and then they realize that, whoa, it's not nearly enough. And so firms start working together. So in the book, I talk about voluntary self-regulation, efforts like the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil and the Beef Moratorium, and, and efforts to make sure that all soy is grown, uh, not in the deforestated, am deforested Amazon. And I talk about how self-regulation can make so much difference, but as you work it, you discover it's not enough, that self-regulation is not stable. So what do you do then? Well, then you say, okay, we've got 67% of the world's consumer goods company promised to buy only sustainable grown palm oil, but that remaining 20%, they're trouble. We've got to get them on board because our business model will suffer. We have got consumer pressure, we've got employee pressure, we've got to fix this problem. So what are we going to do? Two places to turn. The first is to investors. We have to persuade investors that solving these big issues is in our own interest. So let's change the accounting system. Let's measure the, the environmental, social, and government issues that have a material effect on firms' performance that can let an investor tell when you've got a leading edge purpose-driven firm that's going to do well and make their investments, but as well say to investors, you have to tell us we have to perform well. The large investors, you know, something like 12 people control like nearly half the world's financial assets. In my book, I talk about the uh, gentleman who ran the Japanese government pension fund for a while, $1.6 trillion under management, 1% of all the world's equity. He came to believe that climate change was the most important risk facing his portfolio. That if he was going to be able to take care of his pensioners, he had to address climate change and social inclusion and the stability of the larger inclusions institutions. So rewiring finance is an incredibly important step. And then at the end of the book, I get to, oh yes, and free markets need free politics. And I try and tell some real stories about businesses who came to realize that if they didn't step up, the whole society was going to go off the cliff and that business had a really important role to play. But every step in that chain, I'm talking about profits and the business case. Business has a powerful business case to address these issues. It's a collective interest, right? All of us will go down if everything goes south. But in the book, I try and talk, I talk about how we have individual steps that will help us solve that collective case. And um, I guess it's obvious. Um, I really believe it. I, I really think oh, it could happen. Excellent. I, th I think that is precisely the strength of the book uh, that you, um, uh, you know, walk the reader through some really specific steps and also you include some absolutely, uh, you know, fantastic stories from your research, including the one about uh, tea, which I, I really, I really liked. Oh. Uh, now, let me ask you this, uh, Rebecca. So without naming names, there are politicians out there and they have a lot of followers who say that consumers would suffer if we were to take this path, meaning that costs would go up, why do that? We're going to kill, you know, the economy. How do you respond to that? It reminds me of talking to Kodak. Sure, Rebecca, the market's going to go digital at some stage. We'll, we'll invest in digital technology. We'll make some investments. But right now, all the money's in conventional film. And yeah, we'll do something in digital, but don't move too fast. It's not really happening. We're busy. We don't have the skills. It reminds me of working with Nokia. Um, I don't know how many people on this call remember Nokia. I spent a year of my life trying to persuade Nokia that Apple was a serious threat. Uh, trying to persuade them to put Symbian, which was the operating system of their phone, into the public domain. But they said to me, we spent a billion dollars building this operating system. If we give it away, we'll have nothing. I say, if you don't give it away, you're going to lose the firm. That's the moment we're in. And I think the exciting thing is we have the technology and the resources to make this transition. Addressing the problem of climate change, for example, will cost much, much less than addressing the cost of the pandemic. Estimates suggest between two and 3% of GDP to make the transition. And, and the benefits include, 
Um, you know, the, the cost of climate change, nobody knows. But, you know, one estimate is 10% of GDP by 2030. I mean, huge costs to us in the longer term and to our children. And not to mention, you know, the death of half the species and poisoning the oceans, the climate, you know, the reefs on which a billion dollar people, a billion people depend for protein will, will be destroyed. I mean, so it's a, it's a worse before better problem. We have to spend a little bit now to make a big difference later. But, but what politician is really going to look us in the eye and say, you know, I don't want to spend properly on education and health because this six-year-old is not going to be a valuable contributor for another 10 years. Really? Really? You want to live in a society where we're letting 25% of our children suffer from malnutrition? Right now, 50% of the kids in the US are suffering from food insecurity. We must address these long-term problems. And I, this doesn't feel to me like a Democratic or Republican issue. This feels like an American issue, like a human issue. We must build a more balanced society. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Now, here's a question that I think is harder to answer by reference to moral principles, right? So I'm going to read it because it's very short, but I think it's an extremely good question. Isn't there a tension between relying on a few very powerful investors to promote these types of changes, right? On the one hand, and on the other, fighting inequality. <laughs> it's of a great question. Attention. I did a podcast with Anand Gariadis, who is the author of Winners Take All. And he looked at me and he's like, Rebecca, you're kidding. Billionaires save the world. I mean, what planet are you on? So um, let me begin by saying, of course, what we need is a broad-based political and cultural movement to reclaim our democracy and rebalance our capitalism. But I think we need business for a couple of reasons. First, we're not going to solve these problems without the capacity and innovativeness of the private sector. It's a... Uh, you know, the reason the transition's not going to be that expensive is because we're going to see a ton of innovations. I mean, look what happened to the price of solar cells or wind power. I mean, it went down faster even than a tech booster MIT professor like myself expected. So we need business to be part of the solution. Secondly, it is not okay for business people to be walking around and saying, my only goal is shareholder value maximization. If that means pushing wages below subsistence levels and uh, toasting the planet, well, you know, I'm just maximizing shareholder value. That is not all right. No business person would say in public that, well, of course I use child labor. I mean, the small fingers, you know, incredible manual dexterity, and, and they're so cheap. No one would say that in public. No business person should say in public, well, of course I pump money into politics to set the rules in my own game. Of course I drive wages as low as I possibly can. Of course, it should not be of course. So part of what I'm trying to do with this book is say, no, if you're committed to the fundamental values of freedom and prosperity, I thought that's what capitalism was about. If that's what you care about, you should be changing. And by the way, there's a ton of money to be made. So I think it's super important to engage with business and to make it as public and transparent as you can. So this crazy thing, I'm suggesting that business lobby to get money out of politics, like wait. And you might say, well, it'll never happen, but I'd say it's happening. And insisting that it happen is really important. We need to bring business into partnership with civil society and government. That's what will get us through this, this moment. So we're getting quite a few questions uh, alluding to regulation, taxes, incentives. Um, so what's your position on those uh, tools that the government can use to maybe send companies or send consumers down the right path if we are to address this issue over the long run? So here's the vision in my head. We cannot save the world by business trying to do the right thing. <clears throat> That's merely a step towards rebalancing the system. What's important is having a democratically accountable, transparent, responsive, capable government that can put in place the kind of regulation so that business can do what it does. 
So when I talk about rebalancing system, that's the system, that's code for, excuse me, we need sensible regulation on carbon pollution. We need sensible labor regulation so that um, firms don't have to, oh my God, should I pay more, but my competitors aren't paying more. We need a minimum wage. We need policies around healthcare and sick leave so that the government is setting the playing field so that firms can compete and not have to worry about these issues. I am not suggesting that, don't worry, business has this, business is going to save the world. No way. Everything we know historically is we're going to need government to change the rules. But I think business can be helpful as a constituency that says, look, um, I'm invested in renewable energy. It's doing great for me. Why don't we have a price for carbon? We have groups like We Mean Business, which is more than 2,000 firms coming together to work with state and local governments saying we need decent carbon regulation. We're increasingly seeing in the wake of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's horrible murder and the desperate situation of people of color in this country, increasingly seeing businesses step up and saying, okay, I will do what I can with hiring. I will work with promotion. But you know, you, the city, you need to improve your education and healthcare system. And we will work together with you to make that happen. I know one private equity uh, investor who pushed every firm in his portfolio to send a letter to the local mayor of the city saying, I like being in your city. I like working here. But unless you start to address these kinds of issues, I might need to go somewhere else. So I see business as a part of a coalition that really rebalances our society. No, oh, absolutely. And I think uh, that's uh, the correct way of looking at it, uh, at least uh, here from a U.S. perspective. Now, you do bring into the analysis in the book other countries, other economies and their companies, and the whole institutional setup in those places that perhaps... Um, represents an alternative to the way we are going about doing things here in the United States. So in particular, you mentioned Germany, but feel free, of course, to talk about any other countries here. Uh, But um, in what ways are they ahead of us in terms of reimagining capitalism? I do talk about other countries, but I also talk about the U.S. back in the 50s, 60s and 70s. I was talking to uh, one podcast host and he looked at me and he said, Rebecca, your book shouldn't be called Reimagining Capitalism. It should be called Take Us Back to the U.S. Capitalism in the 50s and 60s Only Without the Misogyny and the Racism, Please. And I said, yeah, we could call it back that, but it's not really a a good, a good, a good title. So, um, but but what does that mean? That means that, that business in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s thought their goal was to build a thriving society. Until the 70s, General Motors had its in in its annual report, here's how we're working with all stakeholders that we touch. It was considered entirely appropriate to think about running a firm as part of a much broader whole. And yes, that is explicit in countries like Germany or Japan or Denmark. It's not perfect, but those societies are much more equal they are moving in in Germany and uh, Denmark, moving much more aggressively on problems like climate change. And in both those, so I tell the story of, for example, Denmark in the book. People tend to think, well, Denmark is somehow different. They're all kind of, they, they all love each other and it must be something to do with Danish culture. No. If you go back and read 19th century Danish history, you see the Danes are humans just like us. They hated each other. There was a huge war going on between business and labor and government. They just lost a literal war. And Denmark was much smaller than it had been. And and a very visionary guy running one of the big Danish labor associations. um, I'm going to mispronounce his name, so I'm not going to try. But he came to the conclusion that if they didn't fix this very high level of tension, what we would call real partisan politics, the whole society was going to suffer. So they sat down with the labor unions. They sat down with government and they said, look, let's invest in retraining. Let's, in, let's have a decent minimum wage. Let's make sure everyone who wants it can get a job and have decent health care and decent child care. And you look at the statistics. I mean, people working in a, Den- in a McDonald's in Denmark make $26 an hour and have free child care and subsidized schooling. 
it's, uh, it's at least worth looking at. I think we need to find an American way, but I think there is an American way that values everyone in the society and values the long term. I don't think that's an un-American idea. I think we can reclaim that and, and build our own kind of reimagined capitalism. And would you uh, take that argument one step further to say that the international competitiveness of the U.S. economy would be so much greater if we made these kinds of investment? Because just using the case of Denmark, so the most successful wind uh, energy company in the world in terms of the equipment happens to be Danish, right? Vestas. And, and so Germany. is that an argument that you would... Um, you would oh, uh, but Germany, Mauro, this is your expertise. What <laughs> fraction of the German economy is exported? What fraction of manufacturing exports worldwide are German? Those numbers are astounding, right? Because they invested in their workforce, because they thought there was a way to build a firm that worked both for the people who owned it and the people who worked there, they invested in education and apprenticeships. And now they're, you know, stunningly ahead of us in many, many industries. No, I mean, this is more your expertise than mine, but with your encouragement, I will go there. I think the U.S. is shooting itself in the foot by not paying, by not supporting people of color in the ways that they need to, to be, um, you know, supported sounds like they can't do it on their own. But if you're, you know, if you have a healthcare system that doesn't work and an educational system that is like really not working for you, that's like starting to run with weights on your feet. If you don't have decent jobs, your parents are working, you know, we are just shooting ourselves in the foot. And we're losing out on all the new industries that are going to be, um, uh, that are in the process of emerging as we deal with climate change. Transportation is going to be transformed. Agriculture is going to be transformed. Infrastructure is going to be completely changed. Food is going to be completely changed. Automotive, you know, all, not to mention the power industries, all these sectors are shifting. And who's in the lead? Right now, China is making more aggressive investments than we are. As you say, the Danes have the most successful wind company in the world. Our, our car companies, with one or two exceptions, are saying, nah, electric vehicles may be later. You know, and they're investing at a minimal level. This is crazy. This is like the whole US is Kodak or Nokia and not responding to the changes that, that we need. Yeah. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, as you know. Uh, we're getting, uh, lastly, uh, we have uh, only four minutes left, Rebecca. Um, we're getting quite a few questions about uh, norms, values, culture, ethics, all of these things. Um, how do you respond to that, uh, to somebody who says, look, Rebecca, it's all about whether we actually educate people so that they have the right priorities and they have the right values. How would you respond to that? So one of my best friends read an early copy of, of my book and got so angry. He said, Rebecca, you go on and on about the business case and changing the rules, but this is all about an ethical problem, changing the norms and changing the culture. And I said two things. The first is, you're right. I don't think we're going to get to where we're going to go until and unless we embrace our responsibility for those born into less fortunate circumstances and our children's children. I do think this is a major cultural and ethical shift. But my understanding of history and social shifts is that ethics and culture are always partners to rules and institutions. That institutions alone can't do it. There's a wonderful book, Why People Obey the Law, which is precisely about the fact that most societies work because we decide to pay our taxes because we think it's the right thing to do. And we don't murder our partners because we think it's the wrong thing to do. And so every strong society has a strong ethical core. And that's what I mean. When I say we told our business leaders that maximizing shareholder value was all they had to do, we, we kind of took a knife to one of the ethical pillars of our society. And so what we need to do is rebuild. We need to change the rules and talk about purpose. We need to lobby and fight and vote and change our political system and talk about the fact that we are one nation and that we need to be responsive to the whole community. 
this is all about rediscovering that as all the great faith traditions have known for a long time, thinking only about me and now is a deeply unskillful way to live. And we must rediscover our commitment to us and later. Yeah. So I, I, I read the book and now that I listen to you with uh, all of the passion, uh, I'm even more persuaded. Uh, but let me ask you one final question, Rebecca, which I think is really, really important. Um, so what would you tell ordinary people? So these are not the business leaders. These are not the people who are movers and shakers. These are not the investors who can you know, re redirect uh, companies in one direction or another. What is it that each of us can do as individuals to make progress on this front? So first, I know how difficult this moment is. Some of you are suffering from COVID, have lost family or friends. Many of you are having economic difficulties, or perhaps you're simply depressed looking at what's happening in the world. I know I dice with depression, and I am immensely privileged, and, and I know it, but, but the world is in a tough spot. So, so let me acknowledge how tough this is to believe that you could make a difference. But let me tell you, you really can. So how? You are probably working somewhere. You're an employee. Work with your company. So many of the stories in my books about people like Michelle Legens, who had this bizarre idea that tea could be sustainably grown and there was a business case for doing it. It took him six months to persuade his uh, bosses that he wasn't out of his mind. He persuaded them. He was right. He is one of the reasons Unilever is what it is. And he was just a brand manager in the tea unit. You are a neighbor put the solar panels on your roof, fly less, eat less. We learn from each other. We need a massive cultural shift and all the social psychology suggests it comes from individuals. You're a consumer. Think about what you buy. Firms really pay attention to their consumers and you are a citizen. Vote, vote, vote now more than ever. You know, we need an avalanche, a massive avalanche, and we are all pebbles. I mean, I sit here in my room and talk to a camera and I think, am I doing anything? And I, I just tell myself, we are all pebbles, but it's pebbles that start the avalanche. And if none of us do, if we do nothing, nothing will happen. But if we move, we can move this society. Humans are smart. We can do this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, uh, Rebecca. We oftentimes underestimate, I think, how much we can do to address each of us, to address uh, really important problems. So on that note, I'm not going to ask the audience to, uh, you know, give you a strong round of applause. I'm sure they're thrilled, uh, you know, about everything that you've said. Uh, but I'm going to uh, ask uh, Nancy to jump, jump back in and uh, to uh, bring our event to a uh, conclusion. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, for your immensely thoughtful oh, answers to Mauro, thank my you questions so much. and to the audience's questions. I can't wait to grill you on September 10th. <laughs> so the hat will be on the other foot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's up to me now just to thank you both enormously. Rebecca, thank you so much uh, for this conversation and uh, beyond that for the book. The book is such a contribution, and Mauro, you really have um, prompted a lively and important conversation, which I think we can all learn from. And I thank the audience, too. There were wonderful questions. We could only tackle a few of them, um, but we'll take a look at them afterwards and see if there's some way to address them beyond this conversation. So many, many thanks. Rebecca, one of the things that struck me in your book is your call for imagination, the importance of imagination in, in really seeing how you can make a difference, what changes are possible. And so I think this pairing of your book with Morrow's uh, is such an interesting one and we'll have an opportunity maybe to think about the trends that could really spark imagination on September 10th when the two of you are back again uh, for a discussion of Morrow's book 2030, how today's biggest trends will collide and reshape the future of everything. So thank you both again for this important conversation and for being with us today. And thanks to the audience for participating as well. Nancy, thank you very much. Thank it's you very much. Mauro, thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Goodbye. Bye.